Well, good morning. We're going to start, let's start by reading the first few verses of Ruth. Ruth is a classic U-shaped story, and that, like the story of the Bible, it starts good, it goes bad, and then comes back good again, which is the kind of stories I like. Uh, Ruth is one of my favorite stories. I read it several times a year. Uh, often, it's just uh, one of those pick-me-up stories. It's one of those, God sees you, he hasn't forgotten you. Um, those messages that we, that we love, that I need to hear. And it's also short. It's four chapters, so you can get that message fairly quickly. Uh, similar to the book of Job, but Job has 42 chapters. And, but if we take the first two chapters and the last two chapters of Job, we get something of this U-shaped story that we like. Well, let's start Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malchon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malchon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So we start off it's this happy family. It's sort of like one of those disaster films. Everyone's happy. They're going on a little trip, and then suddenly things go badly. For those of you that like to see the literary bits of the Bible, this paragraph that I read is framed very nicely. You can see that someone took a lot of time writing this. It wasn't just thrown together. It says that uh, a man of Bethlehem, he, his wife, and his two sons, and it's bracketed with this statement, so the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. I love the care that the author has taken to, to write this and to communicate this. What we see right away, we have the theme of suffering and loss. We are faced with suffering and loss. And today we want to talk about loss and how are we supposed to handle loss because it's not easy for us. We don't like it. I don't like it. It's not, it's not fun. And I believe that losses are exactly where our faith is tested. That we are given losses to help us evaluate our faith and to see how is the relationship between us and God? Do we really have faith in Him? Or are we just looking at our stuff or the people that we've lost? And then we have no hope. So what we want is to inspire hope, and that's why we read the Bible, and that's why we're reading Ruth. So the family goes from Bethlehem, which is in Judah, they would have traveled about 60 miles. It would be similar to a person from Israel, a Jewish person, going to what is now the country of Jordan, 95% Muslim. This would be a scary trip. It says they went and they sojourned there. They wanted to take a look. Let's go see if we're going to be able to survive there. 
Then it says at the end of what I just read, they remained there. They found something that seemed like it was going to work for them. They thought, I think, I think we can make it here. We can find food. The, the men found work. I'm trying to imagine what would have possessed an Israelite to say, I think I'll go to Moab. Maybe Elimelech, you know, met someone at the post office who was from Moab. <laughs> he said, hey, the, you know, there's not much food here. Hey, we've got food in Moab. In fact, you can work for me. I'll employ you and your two sons. Just, just come over to Moab. So we went home, talked to Naomi about it. They thought, oh, look, you know, it's tough here, so I think we should go. And they packed up their stuff. I would have imagined that their children were teenagers. Why? Because it's a difficult trip. The trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jesus talks about that trip. In a parable he tells, does anyone remember what parable has the trip from Jerusalem to Jericho? The parable of? The Good Samaritan. Oh, what happens on the road? There are robbers. This is, this is not a, a light decision they have made. But they go, they get a sojourn. There they're going to take a, they're going to take a look. Is it really what the man at the post office said it was going to be? They find, in fact, they have employment. They're able to uh, make things work. But then tragedy strikes. Elimelech dies. Well, they could have come back, but they somehow, maybe the, the boys had girlfriends. They were going to get married. They thought, you know, I think, we'll, I think we can stick it out. We've got some prospects here. Besides, the trip back is even worse than the one coming. This trip from Jericho to Jerusalem is 14 miles, 5% grade uphill. It's a very difficult trip. It's not one that you think, oh, let's just you know, take a little walk, a little stroll. This is a significant trip. And imagine if you're taking anything with you. You're carrying it. You're going to carry some water, perhaps, because this is a, a dry area. It's a difficult trip. So Naomi has three big losses. Then her sons die. Now how, how did this happen? I mean, we're not told what happened, but these are young men. They're in a hostile land. You can just use your imagination. Was it the stress of living in hostility that just collapsed their immune system and they got some sort of illness? Was it a crime to, for two men to die that quickly together, young men, brothers? You, know, you have to start thinking, was there foul play? Was there criminal activity? Look. The god of Moab is Chemosh, and the god of Ammon is, is Molech. These are gods that delight in child sacrifice. They love it when you throw your babies into their fire. I'm just going to take a little pause on that and say, which babies do you think they threw into the fire? the ones they didn't want. When you have an idolatrous system of worship, basically, you're worshiping yourself. You're just doing what you want and saying that that's what the God wants. So they didn't go to the temple of Chemosh. They didn't go to worship their God. So they were probably, even if they had an employer who thought they were good employees, I can pretty much guarantee you that they had some neighbors that were not that, not very happy that some Israelis had just moved into the neighborhood. I don't know why these three men died. But I know that Naomi had to attend three funerals 
Think about what this woman has gone through. Three funerals in a very short period of time. There's the personal loss of relationship, but then one of the themes that we're going to be dealing with in the book of Ruth is the economic loss. Who's going to take care of me? What, who's going to provide for me? So the, the women were vulnerable. Here's another, here's another question. Let's say that the sons got sick or the husband got sick and Naomi called a doctor in Moab. I wonder if they got good medical care. Right? These are things you have to think about. I wonder what the, if they had to pay the doctor, but the doctor actually didn't help. In fact, the doctor maybe was very dismissive. And I know there are some people listening to me who have been to a doctor and they have not had a good experience. Maybe the doctor did surgery on someone you loved or maybe on you and the surgery didn't work out so well. The medicine didn't work out so well. The treatment plan didn't work out. You paid them or visited them and they actually did you a disservice. I want to apologize to you on behalf of the medical community. <laughs> Because this actually has happened to me. It happened with my mother. The surgeon uh, was supposed to do her surgery, decided to let it wait six weeks. She wanted to go on vacation. When she came back, my mother had a, a, a cyst, um, and the cyst ruptured in her abdomen, and, and um, her recovery was very, very difficult and very long. And so I had to forgive the doctor. You would have think, well, if... If you're a doctor, doctors will treat you well, right? That's what you would think. But all of us have people that we trust that let us down, and we have to forgive them. So the statement that we often hear is, God never gives us more than we can handle. That's a lie. <laughs> If he only gave you what you could handle, you wouldn't need him. You'd have no reason for him. You just would handle it. And guess who would get to be God? He always gives us more than we can handle. He must. He must. Why? Why? why must? He must because he wants us to grow. He wants us to grow, people. He wants us to be like him. We cannot be like him without being tested. We can't be like him without having losses. He wants us to reign with him and rule with him. There's a plan to this. It's not just testing us to, just for fun. He's training us. He's saying, do you really trust me now? And when you pass that test, guess what? There's another one coming. But it's all done in love. That's what we have to remember. And that's why we're here. Some of you are saying, you know, I'm, I'm tired of all this loss. I'm, I'm ready to quit. Well, I'm glad you came today because I'm here to tell you, no, no, no. There's hope. There is meaning in this. There's life in this. Don't quit. If you quit, you won't get any rewards. The beauty of being tested is there's always a reward. God is going to reward you for trusting him. Faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. Faith is a currency. Faith is powerful. It is a substance. It is not just I hope it works out. It is, I know it will work out. My Redeemer lives. This is going to work out, not just well, it's going to work out really well. All things work together for good for those who love God and who are following 
his purposes for them. What is his purpose for them? It's to rule and reign with him. Well, you can't rule and reign with him if you've not gone through any testing. Oh, David, I'd really like to do surgery with you. Good. Uh, have you had any training? I, you know, I watched a YouTube video. <laughs> I don't want a co-surgeon that hasn't been tested, that doesn't know what we're doing and why we're doing it. I want someone like me who actually knows what I like, the way I do things. And so does Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He wants us to be like him. Actually, he wants us to be his bride. He wants to marry us. And that means we have to grow to his stature. He doesn't want to marry children who always cry and think they're abandoned. He doesn't love us anymore. But this is real. This is where we live. This is the first thing that happens as soon as something goes wrong. And I believe that Naomi was in that crisis, as, as we all understandably would be. We get angry. Maybe she was angry at the Moabites. Maybe she was angry with her husband. Why did you bring us here? Elimelech, look at me now. Maybe she was angry with herself. Why did I agree to, to go to Moab? Or what if she's angry with God? God was supposed to help me. This is his fault. Let's imagine that Naomi had a cell phone and she called you and said, I'm in a jam right now. I'm in Moab. All my men have died. What should I do? Most of us don't know how to handle the grief of another person. I remember when I was young, I, I, I had no idea. I would just avoid them. I, I, I don't know what to say. Well, if you don't know... I. I'll tell you, you can just say, I'm very sorry at your loss. I'm very sorry at your loss. You need to say something because if you just avoid them, it, it, it just makes it worse. It even isolates them more. And those of us who've had losses know that it, it means something when someone validates your pain. Shared sorrow is half the sorrow. Shared joy is double the joy. We we want to grieve with those who grieve. Job's friends, in the book of Job, Job has some problems, and we'll take a little look at those. But his friends come and see his pain, and they sit with him in silence for seven days. Sometimes we just need a person to hear us, to listen to us, to say, I'm sorry. Maybe she just needs to vent but we want to be good listeners and to validate someone we don't need to fix it. In fact, we can't, can we? And many of us, in our discomfort with sorrow and sadness, we try to fix it. Oh, you'll find another husband. <laughs> Sons, you can adopt. Uh, we're, we're, right, we're just trying to make the problem better. No, that's, that's not our job. That's not our job. Our job is to sit with them. Our job is to listen to them. Our job is to validate their pain. Naomi, your pain is real. I am so sorry that this happened to you. Is there anything I can do? Is there any way I can help? Often when we have pain, we need to forgive. I believe that Naomi probably had some people that she needed to forgive. I don't know, maybe her husband, maybe the people, maybe the doctor, maybe herself. Some of us need to even... I will say, forgive God, 
it's not proper theological terminology because God hasn't done anything wrong. But if you're angry with someone, forgiveness can help. And forgiveness essentially releases them. The other option is self-pity. Is feeling sorry for ourselves. And when we have losses, especially if our other family members, our neighbors, we don't see them having the losses, we feel that we are unique and that we must suffer this loss and maybe God is angry with us or he's forgotten us. And so self-pity is a big problem, a big problem, especially for followers of Jesus. Because what we're trying to do with self-pity is we're trying to comfort ourselves, right? Self-pity is a form of comfort. I didn't deserve this. I shouldn't have had this happen to me. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. The enemy, the serpent, Satan, has his own Comforter, and it's called self-pity. As we engage in self-pity, woe is me, I can't believe this has happened to me. I didn't deserve this. This should never have happened to me. Look what I do. I attend church. Look what I... I do so many good things. I'm so nice. <laughs> I take my recycle bins out. I do so many good things. There is no reason for bad things to happen to me. God is trying to grow us. He's trying to test our faith. If he doesn't test your faith, we're all going to be little babies. If I do something for you, God, you, you do something for me. That's the way it works, right? Some of us have never gone to him to say, God, do you understand my loss? Do you understand my pain? We think he just sits up there passing judgment and has no pain, no losses. Well, let's think about Jesus. Did he have any losses? Oh, my. Oh, my. God comes to earth, and how do they treat him? They spit on him. They try to tear him down. They called him the devil himself, Beelzebul. Anything good he tried to do, they tried to turn it into something evil. Think about it. If you had been healed by Jesus, and now the religious leaders are saying, oh, the devil did that. Now, now how do you feel? It's, it's, you see what I'm saying? It's very confusing. They tried to tear down every possible thing that he was doing that was good. But the father also has losses. Now, Naomi lost her husband. Her husband died. But what if she, he, she had lost him to another woman? Would that have been even worse? There's one thing if your husband died. There's another thing if he just rejects you. This is a lot of pain. How much rejection does God go through on a daily basis? Jesus did nothing but good and they rejected him. From the beginning of our lives, we are given good things. Something bad happens and we reject him. Very, very common. But God knows about loss. When people walk away from him, he knows about loss. He feels the loss, and he lets us know about it. Let's pause. I want to give you a minute. I want you to go to him specifically for validation. God, do you understand how I feel? Do you understand my losses? Can you relate to my losses? And I want to allow you to comfort me. Maybe I've been going to the refrigerator for comfort. Maybe I've been going out to eat or, or watching movies or doing things that trying to distract myself from this pain. But the only way that it's going to heal is if you comfort me and you let me know that I can grow from this and I can trust you more by knowing that something good 
is coming from this pain. I have an opportunity. Let's pause right now. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Jesus tells us, Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. When we mourn, we are able then to receive his comfort. And I hope that you will continue this at home because many of us have gone through years and years of losses and we are uncomforted. And our ADD and our inability to rest comes from the pain that we feel and we're unable to get comfort from this world and we need to get it from God. And he says, I will give it to you. If you are poor in spirit and you are humble, you are going to receive losses and you are going to need comfort. And if you mourn, I will comfort you. I want to let you know how I think about losses and how I reframe my losses. One of the things that happened at the fall of man is that the serpent told Eve, if you eat the fruit, you will become like a god. She thought, oh, that's a great idea. I want to be a god. She ate the fruit. What happened is it disconnected her from God and made her like the serpent. And when I talk about a god, I, I'm thinking of the Greek gods. The Greek gods are very selfish. They're very jealous. They actually act like children. They want everyone to serve them. They want instant gratification. If they lose something, what do they do? They cry and throw a fit. They make you sorry that they lost that, and you will give them what they want, when they want it. This is godlike behavior with a little g. The whole process of this life is to let go of that will and become a servant of God, because we want to be a God like God. Jesus came to show us what the Father was like. And he wasn't throwing his weight around, cursing people, striking them with lightning. Turn the other cheek. Be humble. Wash people's feet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's why they're thinking, what kind of a God are you, Jesus? So when I say I'm a servant of God, we have to think of Jesus. So when we have people, we have things, we have our property. Don't come on my property. I lost my husband. I lost my wife. Those are my kids. Don't touch my kids. Things are mine. If I'm a God, everything is mine. If I'm a servant of God. Everything is God's. I'm a steward of God's property of his people. This is very countercultural. We are taught my family, my spouse, my stuff, my car, my property, I bought it, it's mine. Yeah, who gave you the resources to buy it? Who gave you the mind to invent that thing that made that money? I'm a steward of God's property. I'm a steward of God's people. He gives me a wife to steward that relationship for a period of time. Till death do us part. He gives us property to steward. He'd like us to give some of it away. Why? To show that we're not attached to it. It's not ours. It helps train us. We are stewards of God's property. When you're a God, people and things, your property is always yours. And that means if someone tries to take it, you have to fight for it. You have to become very, very angry. God's become very, very angry and fight for their stuff. How dare you? 
How dare you take my stuff? So losses, and here's where we have to grow. If you have a loss, whose loss is it? If you're a God, the loss is mine. It's very personal. It's my personal loss. That's why we always react to losses. And beloved, it, it's our first response. So don't be hard on yourselves or on Naomi in the scripture if we react to our losses very negatively. It hurts. It's painful. We enjoyed those relationships. That was our livelihood. That was our financial source. That was your job, your health. So losses, we say it's mine, even losses of health. It's my loss. All losses, if you're a servant of God, he made this body. He gave me everything I have. He gave me my mind. He gave me my wife. Everything is God's. Everything is God's. And if I have a problem even with my health, I'm not sleeping well one night, I say to God, you know what? I, it's your body. This is your sleep. If I'm not sleeping well and I'm not able to function tomorrow, that actually is whose loss is it? Well, what if people say things about me if I'm too tired? It's actually God's loss. I'm, I'm here to represent him. And if I can't represent him, well, that's going to be God's loss. That's a difficult reframe for most of us, which is why I have taken some time with this. It's something most of us don't understand. And because we are like fish in the water in a culture that says, oh no, everything's yours, and it feels very true, we are reluctant to say, in fact, it's quite a jump of faith to say, I'm your servant, God. I guess that's your loss. What would you like me to do? How would you like me to worship you in the face of that loss? Because I have to tell you, it hurts. Oh, those who mourn will be comforted. Come to me with your losses. That's a mature way to handle losses. You come to me with them. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about where we should go from here. What about mistakes? If you're a God, what do you do when you've made a mistake? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. What happened... That's right, Sharon. We start to blame the other person. God can't make mistakes. I never make mistakes. It's you. It's you. It's you. It's that woman you gave me, says Adam. <laughs> so when we, make, when we make mistakes, we blame others. Here, if we're a servant of God, we would confess it. We would take it to him right away, as soon as possible, and say, God, I've made a mistake. Uh, I can't fix it. It's done now. I can't fix the mistake. I've said this thing that I shouldn't have said. Um, I did something with my taxes that I shouldn't have done. Uh, there's a letter from a lawyer on my desk. Um, and so I've made a mistake. Most of us think in that moment we are totally alone. And it's a lie. You are a servant of God. We enter that says... You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become like a child. child. Thank you. He's fine with mistakes. You know what he loves, though? He loves the heart when we come to him and we say, Hey, I made a mistake. I acted presumptuously. I lied. I wasn't honest. Uh, I, I, but I need you to help me fix it, Daddy. I need you to help me fix it because you've got my back. I'm, I'm your servant. I'm just your servant. I'm not a God. I'm just your servant. So mistakes here, we confess and we repent. So we confess and we repent. And we then go back to serving him. We go back to being servants, asking him, what would you like me to do? Is there something... That I need to say now. How can I get out of this with integrity? Why? Because I'm also 
Father, I'm also representing you. I don't want to go deeper into a hole by telling more lies or spinning the truth or hiring more lawyers, whatever we do to uh, whatever, whoever we start to trust in to get us out of our problems. <clears throat> but what about our will? When we really want something, if you're a God, the will, you want your will to be done. Again, mine. I want my way. And if you're a servant of God, you want God's will always to be done. And that's the question we must ask in every problem, in every loss. God, what is your will and what would you like me to do now? Now this gets a little bit confusing. Why? Because when you think you're a God, you think your will is God's will. That's a problem. That's a problem. You talk to many people uh, who believe they are very righteous, and people who think they're a God also feel very righteous, self-righteous, and they will say, I speak for God. I speak for God. Very common and very destructive. What I've just laid out is new for most people. The fact that we, from childhood, believe that we are a God. And, it, and we have blinders on. It looks totally normal. It's like you have this, these glasses on. It's like, this is the way the world makes sense. I'm a God. People should serve me. Things should go my way. And Jesus comes, and he's so countercultural, people can't understand him. He has all this power, but he doesn't use it to get his will done. In fact, he seems quite comfortable with people doing evil, even to him. He lets it happen. He says, I could call 12 legions of angels, but I'm just a servant of God, so I'm not going to use the power that I could use to stop this, because God's will is that this crucifixion goes through. To the death, he was a servant of God. Let's pause and look at our lives and see where do we act like a God in the relationships, in the people, in the, in the situations in our lives. Where do we act like a God, and where do I need to confess and repent and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this mess I'm in. So let's pause now. Meditating on these kinds of things, looking at your life, it's called reframing. We want to reframe our lives in light of how God sees us. That is called wisdom. And that is what gives us hope. And so we want to get even more of that, and we're going to read a bit of Job, starting in chapter 1 of Job, because Job's losses are also profound, and how he handles them is also profound. Job chapter 1, I'm reading in the ESV. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. This is the wealthiest man in the country. <clears throat> Starting in verse 9, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. 
but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Verse 13 of chapter 1. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine and they're in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels. Took them, struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters, remember he has ten, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. (laughs) Wow. Sounds like within an hour, the wealthiest man in the country, he has nothing. He has nothing. He has, well, he has the four servants who escaped, <laughs> but, but he can't even pay them because he has not a sheep to sell. He has nothing. They're going to have to go find other work. The man has nothing. Well, he has actually what Naomi, in the book of Ruth, had. he still has his land. Unlike Naomi, he still also still has his wife, which we're going to see, believes exactly what Satan was saying. That as soon as God stops serving you, you curse him. He's doing nothing for you. Wow. I mean, you can feel the weight of this. The man can't meet payroll. He has no animals. Uh, where is he going to get food? Maybe he has a little stored up. Oh, but it gets worse. Then he starts having sores and illness and he's not able to sleep. It is very hard to have faith when you don't sleep. Uh, It's very hard. You lose a night's sleep and your faith sinks. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to have faith. And that's why we're here. We're here to work at it. We're here to build it up. We're saying, I want to believe like Job. I want to to fall on the ground and worship. How? How can you worship when you've lost everything? Oh. The only way, the only way you can worship when you've lost everything is if you have practiced worshiping when you have everything. And you thank God for this, and you thank God for that, and you thank God for clothes to wear, and you thank God that we have electricity, and you thank God for your uh, friends, and for your spouse, and for your children, and for your job, and for money he's given you, and the experiences of the past. This is not the first time that Job worshipped. This is not the first time. This is just what he did. Do you think he really felt very warm and fuzzy at that moment? Oh, heavens. I I can't imagine. I mean, we're trying to imagine what Naomi felt like losing three of her loved ones and her economic prospects. Job was wiped out. All his material goods were gone. And his wife, 
said exactly what Satan predicted Job was going to say. She said, just curse God and die. <laughs> you have to understand here something very important about God. And most of us don't understand this, and that's why we don't understand testing and trials. It has to do with how God loves. Oh, God loves me. We say, oh, I know God loves me. We smile and we say it to each other. God loves me. Hello, he loves you. And then we get some losses, and the first thing we think is, oh, he doesn't love me anymore. He's abandoned me. Love to us is giving me what I want, my will to be done. That's how you show me love. Jesus comes and he says, that is not actually love because everyone does that. That's natural. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward is that to you? Even the tax collectors do the same. The mafia does the same. The criminals do the same. Everyone loves those who love them. In fact, there was a question last week. Someone came to, to ask about people who live in sexual immorality and have a stable, loving relationship. Isn't that okay? Well, Jesus says everyone loves those who love them. It, it's not if they don't want to follow God, then they can do what they want. But it's, you can't say, I'm following God just because I love those who love me. Job's wife is saying, you have proof now that God doesn't love you. Give up on the relationship. And Job says, no, I don't understand this. I would like some answers. And the rest of Job is him trying to get some answers for God from God Job is trying to get answers from God. Why? But our why questions are usually not answered in this life. The why questions we want answered really just require more faith. God said he will work all things together for good. I need to believe that. I don't see how that could happen. Now, in Job's life, it does happen. He ends up wealthier than he was before and has 10 more children, which is a symbol of what eternity will be like for us. The reason we have so much trouble with loss is because most of us don't have eternity in our mind. We have only this world in mind. And Paul says, the Apostle Paul said, if we have just this world in mind, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. All this training is for reigning. We are training for reigning. And Job, if you would have asked him permission, Job, can we take your kids? He went, what, are you crazy? No, 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 I, I, I don't care about eternity. I just want what I have now. God didn't ask him. He took it. Job responded in faith. And Job is famous for all eternity. We are still talking about him. And we will talk about him for all eternity. And God wants that for you, beloved. He wants it for you. He wants them to talk about your faith for all eternity. Can we give up some of our <clears throat> pleasures? Can we take a loss in this life and show some faith? In worship, I sometimes I have to just jump up and down and put my hands in the air. I have to physically move my body because I feel depressed. These losses want to take you down. They want to say, there's nothing to hope for. How you feel is the truth. No, how you feel is a normal human response. You can change that by saying, God has something good in this. I need you to comfort me. I don't see how this is going to work for good, but I trust you and I believe you. So let's just finish by declaring to God, God, I trust you and I believe you. Let's say it out loud. God, I trust you and I believe you.
The losses that I have received, I trust you with them. The losses, losses that I have received, I trust you with them. That you will work my losses for good. That you work my losses for good. And if these losses have produced a blockage between you and I, I remove it. These losses have produced a blockage between you and I, I remove it. You don't have to prove your love to me through my circumstances. You don't have to prove your love to me through my circumstances. You proved it on the cross of Christ. There is no doubt that you love me. You don't have to prove it by giving me what I want. I'm welcome to ask it, ask you, and you're welcome to give it, but I'm not God. I'm your servant. I would like you to be glorified in my life. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Go in peace. Blessings. Let's have faith this week. Amen.